Hey, Deserving Listeners, a lot of you have been asking me to react to the Netflix documentary, The Most Hated Man on the Internet. I think it is about the guy who went to prison for posting revenge porn 10 years ago. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's see what happens. Okay, so first off, what they're saying is that in this documentary, I think they're going to have scenes in which they're showing what the website looked like, where there was revenge porn. And instead of showing the actual images, of course, which would be furthering the abuse of the individuals, they say to protect the victims, no images were used from the original website. So I'm guessing that there were models that were hired for that purpose, and then they made it look like it was. So yeah, that's a good step that they t- that they took. No mother wants to see her daughter's nude photo on the internet. Well, this is a funny place to start with my reaction, but I am about sex positivity and freedom of expression, as you know, and she just said, no mother wants to see naked pictures of her daughter on the internet. And what I would say is, that's not true. And if someone has a daughter who actually chooses with knowing what they're getting into, and they're not too young to really understand those kinds of things, and there are plenty of people who work in the pornography industry, they know what they're getting into, they're not being forced into it, they enjoy it, they like that work, they would prefer that work, their mothers are fine with it. In fact, their mothers might have done it themselves as well or might be doing it at the time. So to say that no mother wants to see her daughter uh, on the internet I think is uh, not true. And I also think that that might even be part of the problem with this, which maybe we'll we'll get into. But anyway, is it okay for the mother to not want to see naked pictures of her daughter on the internet? Absolutely. Is it atrocious and criminal and psychopathic to post pictures of naked people on the internet without their consent? Uh, Yeah. I felt completely violated, in shock. There were comments and comments of people just mocking me. She's a whore, she's a slut. And I wasn't worthy of being around my children. Yeah, the damage is severe. It's, like I said, psychopathic and criminal. It's abusive. I remember when this was going on and thought, why? (laughs) I mean... And it's interesting to think back because I also remember at the time, and I can't remember how long ago this was, but I remember thinking, well, but we don't really have regulations for the internet. Now today, of course, there are regulations like revenge porn being illegal, for example. But back in the day, it was a wild west on the internet pretty late into the internet's run, right? Until fairly recently, the internet was just considered a free-for-all where you could do anything. And to some extent, it still kind of is. So yeah, I remember thinking, well, someone should put an end to this, but they probably won't because there was a lot of movements among the people and among politicians politicians, because they're elected officials by us, to keep the internet free, because it was worried that the government would ruin the internet. They would try to make it into like TV broadcast, which has a lot of restrictions on it, right? The people didn't generally want that. All my links to social media, my phone number. There was no hiding my internet. You were fully on display. That site was about destroying lives. They flashed another scene where it said herpes confirmed. I do remember different websites being created and talk about how there would be movements against individuals who are harmful. For example, you might have an abusive partner or someone with an STI who doesn't inform you. And as a way of trying to create justice in a world that often doesn't have any justice, people would create websites. And there, I remember there was one website where you could register someone as a bad romantic partner, as, as an abusive individual. And you would post a picture and a name and a birthday and where they live maybe, maybe the city they live, and then a description of what they did to you. So on one hand, you would say, well, well, that's good, right? Because that protects individuals. On the other hand, without any kind of regulation, someone could lie or be distorted or something and create complete lies about you and destroy your life, right? And I remember being on the fence about that when it when that first started to crop up. I remember thinking, well, wouldn't it be good as an individual? Wouldn't you want to know if you're dating someone 
in the early days of the internet, a lot of people, including myself, were idealistic about it and thought that it's this is going to be great. The internet's going to be great because it's going to have more information so that we can protect ourselves in a variety of ways from misinformation and other kinds of things, for example. Uh, little did we know that, of course, the internet would become the dumping ground for everyone's, well... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I would say anyone who has some kind of problem personality-wise is probably doing that problem on the internet without any kind of pushback from society or very little consequence. She says, look it up. You're on page two. And there I was, right there, topless, nude, um, multiple photos, and my heart dropped. Yeah, it's awful. It's sexually abusive. It's, like I said, criminal, psychopathic, meaning that it lacks empathy and remorse for your actions. It's callous. It's embedded in misogyny and continue to be harmed. It's not like this is over. For example, I remember Jennifer Lawrence, right? And other people had their phones hacked into and naked pictures, private naked pictures that they had taken leaked on the internet. I do remember this, actually. When, when Jennifer Lawrence's pictures were posted, I remember previous to that, a lot of people were just like, well, you know, you take pictures of yourself and you get what you get, that kind of thing, because that's just what's going to happen. And then there was this attitude change in society, I think around the time Jennifer Lawrence, because I think she, if I remember right, spoke out about it and said, look, it's one thing for people to have hacked into my phone and taken the photos. It's another thing that millions upon millions of people are looking at the photos. They're seeking them out, knowing that these were illegally obtained, which is horrible. That's on everyone. And I remember there was a shift in culture at the time, or at least in my cir circle, where people started to actually take personal responsibility for their actions on the internet. Because I think before that, it was just considered like, well, I'm not responsible for what happens on the internet. But I think as time went on, of course, we're all responsible for what happens on the internet. Everything we click on is a vote for that type of content. And if we click on, if we know we're clicking on something and we know it's going to have photographs that were illegally obtained and abusive to an individual, then you are complicit in the crime. You're probably not going to serve any time or be charged or anything, but it'd be like if someone stole all the items out of someone's house and you go over there and you go, oh, okay, I'll take that plate. I don't know if it's that far, but it's something along those lines, right? And I rem actually, I remember I was actually with one of my friends and we were with one of their friends, one of my friends, a friend of a friend. And the friend of a friend was saying, oh, you got to see this Jennifer Lawrence pictures. And I remember me and my friend going, no, 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 don't. One, we're not going to look at those. Two, don't look at those because that's not okay. And I remember him going like, what do you mean? So I remember that shift of thinking. And at the time, I think this shift had not happened yet or was in the process of happening. So yeah, for her to have these pictures illegally posted, illegally obtained, illegally posted, I assume they were illegally obtained, but at the very least illegally posted because it's not with, with her consent. It's just awful. It's just awful to think about. Under the photos, people were allowed to leave comments. They'd be called whores, fat cows, creature with nasty teeth, slut, you know, just hate-filled comments. Ugh, it's just awful. And this goes on today, make no doubt about it. 4chan, 8chan, all sorts of places out in the open. There will be things on YouTube or Twitter that are along these lines, certainly comments that are along these lines, and it's horrific. The thing I'll say as a clinician is that, as people will say in common society, is that hurt people hurt people, right? A lot of this on the internet is that. These people are very hurt, abused, struggling. They hate themselves. They're lost. And they don't know what else to do. And for some of those people, they will resort to this. It makes them feel better. It makes them feel superior for a you know, half of a second when they leave a comment like this they feel by comparison superior to the person being bullied online, particularly if it's a mob of people bullying someone. And for an instant, they don't feel worthless anymore. For an instant, they feel somewhat superior or at least distracted from their self-hatred. 
And so that's one reason. Another reason is that we have a percentage of society who are psychopathic, sadistic, Machiavellian, dark triad, dark tetrad sorts of individuals. And these people wake up in the morning and actually either don't care about other people's feelings innately and or they want to harm other people. These are sadistic individuals. And these people, before the internet, it was hard for them to get their pleasures. It was hard for them to harm other people because when they did, the consequences would be fairly immediate. Not always, of course, particularly if it was a intimate, an intimate partner violence relationship. But if they were to walk up to someone on the street and say these kinds of things, someone would take it wrong and, and harm them back, or at least out them or get them fired from their job or something like that. But when the internet came out, all the psychopaths and the sadists, they thought, well, I can get away with all of my pleasures here. I can harm countless individuals all day long and incur no consequences. Now, it probably isn't as pleasurable as harming people in person. You know, there's fewer consequences and so much more easily enacted because you just pull out your phone or your computer and boom, you're, you're at it. You don't even have to leave the house. And research has shown this, that there's a very small percentage of people who are actually like this in real life. Uh, psychopaths make up one or two percent of any particular society. Sadistic psychopaths make up a very little percentage. It's even hard to gauge because the, the number is so low. Psychopaths, generally speaking, are people who don't don't have empathy for other people. They don't care about their feelings. They don't have remorse when they harm other people. They might exploit others. Sadistic people are people who actually take pleasure in harming others. You can be a psychopath and actually not harm other people, or at least not harm other people very often. However, if you're a sadist, you will take pleasure in harming people. You can also be a sadist and have empathy. So you can have an urge or you take pleasure in other people's harm, but you care about other people so you don't enact your pleasure. Whereas if you have a sadistic psychopath, then you have someone who doesn't care about other people's feelings, and I'm summarizing pretty severely. So you have a psychopath who doesn't care about other people's feelings, and you have a sadist who actually takes pleasure in harming people. These are very dangerous, very problematic individuals. So very, very small percentage of these people exist in the world. I would put it at 0.1% of individuals, maybe less. So these people are rare. However, However, when you add up seven and a half billion people, or are we at eight billion yet? And you say 0.001% of people are sadistic psychopaths, you're talking about millions of people. And a lot of them have the internet. So a larger percentage of the comments are representative of sadistic, psychopathic individual, or at least psychopathic individuals. Meaning that if you just took all the comments around the internet, especially the mean ones, there, you, you might find 5%, 10% of the, those comments are actually being posted by psychopathic or sadistic psychopathic individuals. Whereas in the real world, if you were to walk around, you might not ever run into one of these individuals, but online, you probably have run into one of these individuals. So that's another reason. But of course, that's not the majority. The majority of these comments are from people who are not psychopathic and not sadistic. They're, like I said, confused or, I don't know, young, immature, following toxic masculinity, following sex shaming, following victim blaming, because our society teaches young people to victim blame, to sex shame, to slut shame, to hate women, to think that people who post pictures of themselves on the internet is some sort of disgrace. You know, that's a whole other part of this. It's like, say someone put those pictures of themselves on volitionally, because I think that was part of the website, actually, that some people actually put their own pictures. They took pictures of themselves and they posted them on the internet, and there would be these kinds of comments. And it's like, why? <laughs> Someone took a picture of themselves uh, naked, and what's wrong with that? Like, it's just a picture of someone's body. Like, calm down. Now, to be clear, if someone's pictures are stolen or posted without their consent, then, yeah, that's, that's a problem. But I'm differentiating between illegally obtained, illegally posted, between it was consensual and the person did it on their own. One day, he tells me about a website he set up called Is Anyone Up? Well, it all started with, um, you know, me hating some dumb bitch who broke my heart, really. And that's how it started, dude. My yeah, it's interesting that he actually admitted that because that's often the case, that 
people who are engaging in toxic masculine tropes on the internet. A lot of red pill people, incel people, MGTOW people, pickup artist people, manosphere people. Not all of them, but a lot of them are motivated to those toxic cults on the internet because they were hurt and they don't know where else to go and the world doesn't provide a lot of support or support that doesn't challenge what they think of as being masculine. You know, we teach young boys that they need to do everything in their power to avoid being girls. Girls are not taught that they can't be boys. Young girls are damaged in a whole suite of other ways. But one of the damages that we do to young boys is we tell them that if they are seen as a girl, if they are seen as girly or feminine, then they're not a man, one. And two, if you're not a man, then you're worthless as a human being. You are utterly worthless. You are discountable, you're ridiculous, you're stupid, you're shameful, you're a disgrace to your family, and you have no worth at all. It's getting better, but we're clearly not out of the woods. And for a lot of boys, men, when they enter into relationships and they get hurt, which always happens to, I would say, everybody, you go to the internet or you talk to your friends and you're trying to find some answer. Why did this happen? And you're angry and you're hurt. Well, and then another thing that we teach young boys is that they can't have emotions. They can't be vulnerable. They can't cry. They can't ask for help. And so they're alone. They're in pain. And they can't talk with anyone. They don't even know what's really happening to them. They go to the internet and there's this whole set of micro cults that are part of the bigger cult of the incel, MGTOW, that whole thing, Manosphere. And that cult has answers. The answers are wrong, but they have answers. One, they will support you. They'll say, I, I was like you, I went through that. So you get this immediate emotional support, which is good. But then they start infecting the individual's mind with a bunch of lies about feminism and about what is okay to do. So for Hunter Moore, he was, he said he was hurt. There was a woman who hurt him, broke his heart, okay? Almost universal experience. and. He didn't know where else to go. And I'm just gonna take a guess and say that he was socialized as a child within the full toxic masculine model. I don't know that, but I'm just gonna take a guess about that, <laughs> given the way that he talks and the way that he is. As with all of, all boys are, and myself as well, I was indoctrinated into that well, but there's different degrees anyway. So he started the website because, and I don't know the exact sequence, but maybe he even posted a picture of his former partner as a way of getting back at her because he didn't know what else to do because we don't help people, particularly men, particularly boys, on an avenue out of their pain, which would be to talk about it, go to therapy, cry. I mean, we literally don't allow men to cry. We don't allow anyone to cry generally, but particularly men. So just think about that. <laughs> Imagine if we lived in a society where we didn't allow people to laugh, like you could never laugh. And if you saw a comedy show and you laughed, you were disgraced and there's something wrong with you. Imagine if we did that to people. Imagine how much pent up energy you would have. And over time, you would learn to beat that out of you. You know, I did this to myself. I've talked about this in the podcast before. When I was a young kid, no one explicitly told me this, but I learned from society that boys don't cry. And so in the fifth grade, I remember every time I had an urge to cry, which, you know, would happen because it's natural for a human to cry every now and then. I would convert it into anger, I remember. And before long, I never cried, ever. No tears, ever. Neurologically, I could no longer cry naturally. When I entered into my 20s, I thought, there's something wrong with that. And particularly as I became a therapist. And so I actually set out to reverse that damage that I had done to myself. And so I would try to push the tears out and it took years, but eventually I started crying and now I cry all the time and I feel great about it. And there's nothing unmasculine about it. In fact, it could be argued it's, it's extremely masculine to cry because you're a man enough and you're secure enough in your manhood that you can be a human being. <laughs> So anyway, you have all those messages being told to boys and men and they get hurt and they don't know what to do. They go to the internet and there's an avenue. There's a way out. It feels 
good. You're getting support. You can get revenge. You can, you have an answer. It's feminism or all women are the problem, or I need to really clamp down on my urges of attachment and romance and maybe even sex because those urges led to pain in the past. And so I need to meditate a lot. I need to be stoic. I need to become ultra masculine and control my urges. And that's not the answer. <laughs> it's just not, I mean, maybe temporarily, but in the end, we all have attachment needs. And so if I were his friend and he was telling me that he was hurt by some woman and he's like not dealing with it well and he says he's going to post these pictures on the internet I'd be like whoa 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 how you feeling and I've had many clients like this by the way as a man therapist a man therapist I will tend to attract more men than otherwise and so I get a higher percentage of of these folks and the healing that can happen when I work with them on allowing them to have their human emotions and the, the tears and the pain, a lifetime will come out of these individuals and they'll look back at some of this behavior that they committed to their former partners or to women in general and think, you know, they'll have a lot of remorse about it and they'll see it in perspective. I hope that he does now. My friends would just post a bunch of girls on, is anyone up? And uh, we just got a bunch of traffic one day and I was like, yo, I can make money off titties and fucking people over. I just thought it was... Uh, now, maybe he is a psychopath. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't actually care about human beings. He could still be a psychopath and also be hurt, have his feelings hurt. It's, it's a misunderstanding, particularly on the internet, that psychopathic individuals have no feelings and no attachment needs. A marker of a psychopath isn't the lack of attachment needs. Generally speaking, it's a lack of empathy, a lack of actually knowing how other people feel and caring how other people feel. So that doesn't eliminate the basic human need of attachment. So. Hunter Moore might actually suffer from psychopathy, any social personality. Uh, I don't know. I'm guessing I'll, I won't get enough information even to build a hypothesis about that, but we'll keep an eye on that. And the sidekick was a smartphone that everyone on the scene was using. So what do you do with a phone with a camera? Take pictures of your dick and send it to people on social media. It was a very common thing for people to send dick pics or you know, girls to send pictures of their boobs to people. It was a way of flirting. Yeah, I remember this cultural trend as well. Of course, we're still in that trend, but I remember at the time in the aughts that people felt like the internet was their own private playground, kind of like a place where your parents and the authorities didn't go. Your teachers didn't know about the internet or they didn't know how to use it, that kind of thing. And it, to young people, it felt like you could just do anything. And, and what it did, I think, is cause a lot of people to, in a unwise fashion, upload pictures of themselves, thinking they're only sharing it to a small community or even just a few people and not realizing that it's the internet and it could go anywhere and people can take the photo and post it somewhere else and it will live on the internet forever. And I'm guessing for most people it's not a disaster, but of course for some people it can be. So this website for that Hunter Moore created, Is Anyone Up, was I think capitalizing on that naivete from individuals. But at that point in time, the internet just felt like this kind of fun festival. Hunter Moore, he showed the world that the internet's fucking permanent and it has the power to ruin your life. Right, so he is saying that the internet felt like it was just this fun festival, meaning that it was a place where it was safe and wasn't super public. Like you're at a festival and you get naked for a second and you just think like, well, yeah, I mean, there's 500 people that saw that, but it's not permanent. And what Hunter Moore demonstrated was it is permanent. And it, had, it was always permanent. It was just not necessarily known to people. All right, well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.